to all you Twitter heads. Connect with CFM Stereo on twitter.com forward slash CFM Stereo. Forward slash CFM Stereo. Southern African Parliamentary Support Trust promotes civic and public participation in parliament business in Zimbabwe and across the Zadig region. SAF's quest is to strengthen parliaments to become truly central institutions in a democracy. The work of parliaments should promote good governance, that is, how public institutions conduct public affairs and manage resources in order to guarantee the realization of human rights. A strong parliament will promote representative democracy. For more information, on the Southern African Parliamentary Support Trust, visit www.saPST.org. Ask the MP what you want to know. It's your chance to chat to your MP and find out what goes on in Parliament. It's your show. Tweet, text, and call us. The mic is yours. A very, very good evening to you on this very special occasion, a special broadcast of Ask the MP. It usually comes to you at 7.30 p.m. at this very time on Tuesday evenings. But tonight we're coming to you live from the Mikos Hotel in Harare Central Business District. We are focusing on a very topical, a very emotive uh, uh, subject tonight. Before I introduce my panel, just to give you a bit more background on this effort that we are doing tonight. Live from the Mikos Hotel, a special edition of Ask the MP powered by the Southern African Parliamentary Support Trust and only on ZFM Stereo, my station, your station. We have an audience that is joining us live at this hotel and we have many, many more who are watching us live on Facebook. So if you're listening to us and you want to watch this live, there's a live stream. Go to facebook.com forward slash ZFM Stereo. You can also follow us on Twitter and also get in touch with us via WhatsApp. The number is 0731-168-045. 0731-168-045. It is a very good evening to you wherever you are tuning in to us from right now. My name is Farai Mwakutuya. My guests tonight are none other than Honorable Temba Mliskwa. He is the recently appointed but clearly very enthusiastic, very aggressive, very action-oriented Parliamentary Portfolio Committee Chairperson on Mines and Energy. Honorable Mliskwa, great to have you on the program. Thank you very much and a very good evening to the viewers. Indeed. Uh, also joining us is a man who is synonymous with uh, the diamond sector in Zimbabwe. He hails from Manika land, Kumakomoyo, where many people expect that it uh, should be a bustling metropolis. Many skyscrapers should be going up there. There should be lots of millionaires there. Sadly, that isn't the case. Farai Magu, he is the director for the Center for Natural Resource Governance. Farai, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Farai, for having me. Now, the reason why we're doing this is because in the recent uh, few days, we know that the committee that uh, Honorable Melisqua chairs has been demanding answers and is trying to get to the bottom of a $15 billion mystery. Zimbabwe's diamond sector, we know that uh, you know, we've had uh, announcements by Zimbabwe's former president uh, to the effect that as much as $15 billion in revenue may have been lost out in that sector. Some people have dismissed it as a figure of speech and that perhaps it wasn't $15 billion. But what is not in doubt is the fact that Zimbabwe didn't get the value that it was meant to out of its diamonds. And Honorable Melisqua, you are at the forefront of trying to get answers as to why. Please tell us what your committee has done so far and what it is that you expect to do next. I appreciate the role of, uh, of, of the p -p -p parliament. The role of parliament is to represent uh, people, to equally have oversight over the executive, to also be able to uh, legislate. You know, those are the three areas where Parliament comes in. And my committee, really, which is a committee of minds and energy, looks at uh, all levels of government, parastatals, who can be questioned or brought before us to, to respond to the issues that we think are not clear. One in particular, of course, is the diamond issue. It's not about witch hunting at all. No, it's about us getting to the facts of everything. There's really nothing wrong 
with having a, a, a committee that probes to find out what goes on and so forth. It's more or less an aspect of accountability, and every institution must be able to account. So I know for a fact that the 15 billion that's talked about is something that really uh, is in people's minds and so forth. But you've got to bring things to closure. You can't have a situation where you have an amount of money which everybody's talking about, uh, whether it was there or not. But the, the thing, truth of the matter is that Zimbabwe had diamonds. We now need to go through the entire, uh, uh, the entire process to see if truly we did realize what we're supposed to realize from the diamonds and so forth. And what really triggers this is the amount of wealth uh, that those who, who did, uh, who did Pre, pre, pre preside over the, 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 the ministries, uh, the ministry achieved wealth. I mean, it's not a secret. Uh, Minister Obert Mpofu is one such person whose wealth just went to certain levels. When the, when the Minister of Finance, you also have got to also bring before us Honorable Chidakwa, former Minister of Mines, to also understand what really was going on and so forth because when we realized with diamonds, we felt these diamonds would assist in the country in terms of contributing to the national fiscus. It never did. So where did the money go to? So it's about a process which is fair, which I think the thing nation needs to know. So in that regard, Parliament is playing its role in representing people and equally uh, having oversight. Honourable Melisco, a couple of questions there. First, I mean, yes, well and good to go after some of these ministers, but we also know that, you know, the buck stops with the chief executive. The president at the time must be answerable for some of these things and perhaps knows the answers. We know or we've heard that you intend to invite the former president. Is that indeed true? And uh, what is the, feasible, the, the, the practicality of him actually appearing before your committee? You see, we've got to be very clear. The parliament is not perturbed what, by what George Charamba says. We don't report to George Charamba. He is a presidential spokesperson. Parliament has a duty to call anybody before them. So while George Charamba is a presidential spokesperson, former and current uh, presidential spokesperson, says that this was a figure which the president said jokingly. But there was never a time where he came also to address people that, sorry, this 15 billion is a figure which the president said jokingly. But he says it after the former president is no longer in office. So we don't take what he says to be what it is. We have to follow the due process at the end of the day. And this is what is critical for everyone to understand. The current, uh, the new dispensation is very clear in terms of zero tolerance to corruption. The old dispensation of the former president also spoke about corruption. Every uh, sitting in parliament that he came before us, he did mention how we zero in on corruption. He never did anything on corruption. And I'm hoping that the current dispensation and the current president allows parliament and every institution to do its work in getting to, to, to a point where we deal with the corruption in this country once and for all. So he says, the president, there will be no sacred cows. So that's basically what we're about. Honorable Mliswa, I will come back to you and pose the very same question, but Farai, let me bring you into the discussion here. You've had brushes with uh, the authorities in the past because you were very outspoken about what you felt were perhaps violations and, uh, you know, a situation that wasn't favorable in terms of what was happening uh, in those diamond fields in Chiazwa. Are you convicted? Are you convinced that this time around we'll get answers to some of the questions that you've been posing? Not at all, mainly because the people who are demanding accountability are actually familiar faces to me. I have interacted with them. They have had an attempt on my life in 2010, and uh, they've amassed a lot of wealth. So I don't see any sincerity in terms of demanding to know the truth on the part of the current executive. Because if there is going to be a real independent investigation into the looting that took place in Marange, then some untouchables are going to be touched. And so this is something which just about saying things which the people want to hear, but it's just a letter without a spirit. There is no commitment to demand accountability from the diamonds that were stolen in Marange. Honorable Meliswa, 
they are untouchables. Will you be able to extend your, your hand and touch them? Uh, as far as I'm concerned, there's no one who's really untouchable at the end of the day. The only person in terms of the constitution of this country who we cannot bring before Parliament to respond, but we can through the House, is, the, is His Excellency. Other than that, there's, there's no one that we cannot bring. And already letters have been written to those people. So when you say they're not untouchable, when you already have things written letters for them to appear before us, why don't you wait for them to appear before us and see whether we've done our role in representing you and ensuring that our oversight mandate is done. I think it is pretty clear to also understand the, the people on this committee the person who chairs the committee too and I think you've got to give us a chance to be able to do our job we were not sent by anybody to do this job but we owe it to, to the nation in our discharge of duty for there to be account accountability in the resources of the country so we are not doing Farai a favor we are not doing you a favor we're not doing me a favor but this is what we have to do as members of Parliament at the end of the day and I'm sure each how each, each sitting would like to have been known to have achieved something. And every member of parliament is itching to also leave parliament knowing that they achieved something. This very same parliament that you talk about, they are untouchables. The former president was untouchable in your eyes, not when it came to this parliament. You know that he resigned when you were having to impeach him. So when the so-called Mgabe was then touched by parliament, who then remains untouchable. We must deal with facts. The pres former president was impeached by parliament. A motion was moved. And that just shows you what parliament can do. Who was stronger than Mgabe at the, at the time? So if we, if, we, if we could touch Mgabe, who else becomes untouchable? With due respect, Honorable MP, the events of the impeachment, I think you know, there were certain factors that had to happen to give Parliament that sort of power, certain ways that they were facilitated to do that. But I don't want to dwell on that. What happens, and I'm sure many people might be asking this, what happens if the people you've summoned decide to ignore your invitation? You can't. Parliament has got rules and, 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 and regulations which are followed. You cannot, you cannot uh, not appear before Parliament when you're summoned. Parliament, if you remember Roy B B B B B Bennett, it's a good example. Though, though, though late, sorry to talk about it, but it's an example when he had to go to, 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 to think prison after the altercation that he had with Chinamasa. He did not go through the courts. Parliament can get you to prison. And that's an example that I'm giving. Unfortunately, he's late, but it's an example I'm giving you that no one can escape the powers Parliament has. Has former President Mugabe been, have you written to him to invite him to appear before your committee? You see, it is a process uh, that we're going through. We're calling the thing ministers first. The, the, the ministers have got to be asked. The, the president mentioned 15 billion. Where did it come from? If they cannot respond to that, then we take it to the next level. It is a process. It's not about witch hunting and so forth. They'll probably say, yes, we also mentioned the 15 billion, and the 15 billion was accounted in this way and this way and that way. If it was accounted in that way, what is the point of bringing him before us? It's only when we're not happy with the representation that they'll bring before us that we then go to the next stage. If you are able to, can you confirm, therefore, to us who you have invited? But I've told you the ministers, the ministers Chidakwa and Chidakwa has come through Mpofu. Walter Shumba uh, uh, Chidakwa uh, Mpofu has been asked to come. We've had uh, the Minister of Mines the other day with all these subsidiaries, ZCDC, which is the Diamond Company, which is there. Well, they've come before us. We've discussed these issues. MMCZ has come before us. We've also discussed these issues. But clearly, they are always there was always a minister who was presiding over this ministry and in any normal sense he's the first person best person to respond to what was going on at the time each minister had their their their, their things stint and we asked them during their stint the diamonds mind where the money went to how much was given to the fiscus at the end of the day father i want to bring you back what is your best case scenario in terms of what's happening here do we just get answers and therefore know that oh, we could have gotten 15 billion, we lost it, uh, at least it's nice to know? Or do we have recourse to actually go after some of these people and recover some of that money? Yeah, I think um, the issue must go beyond summoning people to parliament 
and asking them questions. We must know that the billions that were stolen translate to the death of Zimbabwean people who can't access uh, uh, medical services. It means our children cannot get the education they deserve. It means we cannot have jobs, we can create employment. So I, I want us to move beyond the fantasy of simply joking about 15 billion. It is a crime that was committed against the people of Zimbabwe. So when a person has stolen something, there are two things that must happen. There must be justice. Justice can be reparation in terms of paying back what you have stolen, uh, sorry, restorative in terms of paying back what you have stolen. It can be retributive. We want to see people being arrested, people going to jail, being taken away from society. But the Marange uh, plunder was an international thing. It is not just a Zimbabwe thing. We need to recover what other nations have stolen from us. And to do that, I believe Zimbabwe ought to have an appeal to the United Nations. We need a United Nations Commission of Inquiry because the, the, the illicit financial flows can be tracked. There are bank statements which reveal that Zimbabwe was robbed. This money was banked somewhere. I remember the United States of America, it even confiscated some of the money that was stolen from Zimbabwe. Some of our diamonds were seized all over the world. So if, if this government is, is, is sincere, they must reach out to the United Nations and help us to track the illicit financial flows from our diamond sector. And those countries must be held accountable and they must give back Zimbabwe what they robbed us of. Remember, you can participate in this discussion via, via our various social media platforms, WhatsApp, Facebook Live. We'll be looking at some of the comments there, Twitter, as well as the audience that is here. You can participate, and I'll be opening it up very shortly to you. Very quickly, uh, Honorable Mliswe, a listener called Sammy in Bulawayo has gotten in touch and says, uh, does the committee have an anonymous uh, or tip-offs uh, WhatsApp number or, or box that people could possibly uh, get in touch with you on to help with these investigations, suggesting that perhaps there are people out there who may have information that would aid this investigation? I think they're free to do that. There is the clerk of parliament who's there. And if you want to, be, to also be, uh, to contribute to this, you write to the, to the clerk of parliament. If you're not too happy, you write to the speaker of parliament. If not too happy, write to the honorable member of parliament in your area. If not, you equally write to me and say, I would like to appear before your committee because I've got evidence to give relating to A, B, C, D. So no one is stopped from doing all that and so forth. If you write to the clerk of parliament, you also copy me, the chairperson for the portfolio committee. You can copy the commissioner, the general, acting commissioner general of police. You can copy Zach as well and so forth. You can copy as many people as you want. Even His Excellency you can copy so that you ensure that your matter has been attended to. So no one is stopped at all who has information from appearing before a committee and producing that information. But what is important to understand uh, for Farai, and I'm addressing to the, to the other Farai, <laughs> responding to the other Farai, is that we've got to understand that there is a due process. We cannot be reactionary. There's going to be a due process. Right now, the Zimbabwe Republic Police is not stopped from investigating any minister. Zach is not stopped from investigating any minister. As parliament, we are playing our role. But in playing our role, we don't have, uh, we can only recommend uh, after what has happened, people must understand what our role is. If, we, if, if our findings relate to somebody must be arrested, like we did with uh, the former permanent secretary of mines, Kunjanga, we recommended that he must be arrested and he must equally be fired. And that was taken seriously. No one can ignore a parliamentary recommendation because you, are, you have to comply with that so that you are in line with the Constitution at the end of the day. So what I'm basically saying, we cannot say people stole. Yes, there is an allegation, there is a thinking that diamonds went missing. Yes, it, it's made worse when you see people get, um, getting wealthy during that time too, when they're not operating successful businesses and so forth. You wonder where is the wealth coming from. So it then calls for that probe, for that oversight and so forth. Like I say, let's also rely on institutions like the police, rely on institutions like the ZEC. Equally, the, the residents and citizens of the country, if they're not happy with those processes, you can also go for private uh, prosecution. 
All these are issues which are open to everyone to say, no, we can privately prosecute uh, Temba Mliso, we can privately prosecute uh, whoever you want to. Those are processes open to people to, to pursue that justice, the results that they need. Honorable Mliso, our listener getting in touch uh, from the USA says, uh, are you privy to the Chininga report? Can Zimbabweans know what's in it? It must be full of sacred cows. That report tells you who was in the Marange plunder. No, in fact, as chairman, I would be silly not to go through the Chindori Chininga report. It's an awesome report. The Chindori Chininga report clearly states this is public. I can send it through to him and so forth. It was very clear. It did not name anybody. They were stopped from going into areas. And there were recommendations which were there. So that's a report which the public can have access to. As chairman, I can give it to you. I cannot go into a job and not read reports before. In fact, what I'm actually implementing is a result of the Chininga report, the re, uh, recommendation, the recommendations from my pre predecessor, the former chairperson, uh, Daniel Shumba, and so forth. It is a parliament of records. You just don't wake up and say, it's Temba Mliswa, because I don't like this one, I must do something. I am just implementing recommendations from the Chininga report, which are good. I'm also re uh, implementing recommendations from this current committee, we were, which, which were done under the chairmanship of, of Daniel Shumba. So everything is in line. But for you to say the Chindori Chininga report names anybody, it does not. We can make it, uh, it can, it, we, can, we can give it to the, the public so that you have an understanding of what the recommendations were. Please do. We look forward to getting that report. If there are any members of the audience here who have questions, uh, please uh, do uh, show by raising your hands and we'll bring a microphone to you. But uh, to all our listeners from all over the world, Facebook Live, you can post your uh, questions there. Twitter, get in touch and ask a question uh, and engage with us via WhatsApp as well. I can see uh, a hand up there, a few hands up. We'll begin with, uh, you know, go ahead, uh, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, three short questions. Um, the first one is to Mark Guhu. You said that our diamonds were seized all over the world. Can you cite the places? Uh, the all over the world part is what I'm interested in. The second question is in the event that the 15 billion issues really, I mean, the figure really turns out to be a nullity, what will happen to the people whose images have been tarnished? The last question. Our understanding is that Zimbabwe's diamond sector in Zimbabwe is regulated. What is the view of uh, the Kimberley process certification scheme? Thank you. Indeed. Thank you so much uh, for uh, those questions. I want to take uh, two more. Uh, we've taken note of those. Uh, there's, uh, we can get one from the, mid from the middle section here. Please go ahead, sir. And then uh, if there's, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, good evening. Um, just a quick comment is that uh, Honorable Tim Liswa seems to be a very serious man, and thank you very much for that. Um, my biggest worry on 15 billion is on the utterances that the Minister of Finance just issued a few days ago when he was saying the President might have uh, issued the figure out of context. And I'm happy that you have indicated that uh, you don't report to George Charamba neither do you report to uh, the executive. But my problem is, are we not going to have inconsistency of information that is getting to the, to, the, to the Zimbabweans? How assured are we going to have uh, information that is inconsistent? And just, I think just to follow up on that, uh, raising that point that you've uh, just mentioned about the finance minister and saying it's out of context, we know that... Uh, finance ministers have repeatedly said they, they don't know what was being made in, in Marange, so uh, how can he be sure that indeed this was out of context? That's just my two cents. Final contribution and then we'll allow let's take one from the front here. I will come back to you ma'am, but we'll take one from the front here very quickly and then we'll respond to some of those questions. Also questions coming through via WhatsApp. I'm taking those. Twitter we'll also take those too. Thank you very much. Um, um, my question which could actually be a plea to the chairman of the Mines Committee. The statement that this gentleman gave to us, that um, it shows that Patrick Chinamasa, Honorable Chinamasa, is not even sure if it was 15 billion or less. It shows that they haven't even uh, made an effort to try to understand or account when it comes to Marangas. So I'm sure I want to ask if you have the capacity to 
to even ask the minister, also not uh, the minister of mines, the minister of finance, because it's supposed to be a two-way process. This 15 billion was first issued by Tendai Bitwa, who was still minister, and people thought he was joking, saying 15 billion must might have been lost because as the finance minister are receiving nothing from the mine, minister of mines. So up to now, six, seven years later, Honorable Bochnamasa is still not sure of the actual amount, which shows that he is not even serious about his job. And it should be reason enough for you to ask him, to, 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 to write to him as well, to come before your, your committee. Thank you. Thank you so much. I will allow the panelists to respond. I think I'll begin with you, Farah. Okay. <clears throat> My sister, I'm sure, I, I, I hope I got you well. You said um, uh, you wanted me to comment about the diamonds that were seized, uh, which I said they were seized all over the world. And you said the 15 billion claim is a nullity. And what must happen to the people whose images have been tarnished, mm. tarnished in terms of being accused of stealing the diamond revenues? Thank you for that. Um, the diamonds which were seized, normally what happens with the Kimberley process is that if a diamond parcel is caught elsewhere, even in Zimbabwe, without the corresponding Kimberley process certificate, it is seized by that authority and it possibly returned to the country where it's suspected to have originated from. And uh, that one you need just to Google. Uh, you may find some articles where a, a parcel of Zimbabwean diamonds were seized in India, in Dubai, or somewhere that with fake KP certificates. The issue of 15 billion, to me, it's actually an understatement to say Zimbabwe lost 15 billion. The figure could be more. Why I say that? In 2008, before the mining companies Mbada Diamonds and Canada were licensed to mine, Gideon Gono, then Reserve Bank Governor, and they know he was kind of a de facto Prime Minister, who had also set up a minerals marketing corporation of Zimbabwe unit that carried out what are called mop-up operations in Marange to buy diamonds from artisanal miners. Gideon Gono estimated that Zimbabwe was losing at least 1.4 billion annually. That was in 2008 from artisanal miners. These are people who were digging using holes and picks and shovels. Come June 2009, we had two mining companies that were licensed to mine. In 2009, Obet Mpofu addressed the conference in Namibia where he said, Zimbabwe uh, was, um, okay, uh, in 2009, at a workshop in Namibia, Mpof said production capacity at Chiazwa stood at 600,000 carats per day, with capacity to raise to about $200 million per month. And if you multiply $200 million per month times 12 months, it comes to 2.4 billion dollars. In November, uh, in June 2011, I was in Kinshasa at the Kimberley Process meeting where Zimbabwe was licensed again, was allowed to export its diamonds. When Obed Mpofu came to Zimbabwe, he called for a press conference where he said, I quote, Zimbabwe will not be begging anymore. We are now going to unleash our witness to the world. The, the, uh, the Minister of Mines has the pleasure to announce that it is ready to lead and champion. You can't play against a giant. Without Zimbabwe, you can't have the KP. Our current production is estimated by volume to be in excess of 25% of the world production. And going by the values realized to date per carat, Zimbabwe is set to act to earn in excess of two billion annually. Now, this is the Minister of Mines, and he said according to current values. He was not just speaking from nowhere. So I understand that there is a school of thought that has been introduced into our country, which is a revisionist school of thought, trying to downplay the plunder that took place in Marange mainly because they are sympathetic to the current ruling elite and they are trying to downplay the estimates of Robert Mugabe. But I want to say to you, Robert Mugabe was the head of state and government 
He had all the access to information which you and I don't have. So when he says 15 billion has been looted, we have to give him a benefit of doubt. But he had the minister to report to him. He had the companies themselves. Most of them were conflated between the military, the CIO, and who is who in the ruling ZANU-PF party. So all these people reported to his excellence. Therefore, when Mugabe says 15 billion, I actually say he was very polite. It could be more than 30 or 50 billion that Zimbabwe has lost. Thank you. Honorable Melissa, over to you. I, I think the, the, the issue of the figure is, 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 will always remain if we don't bring to closure the, the, the diamond's mind. That's the reason why, as a parliamentary committee, we are even going to go for the Zimbabwe Defense Forces had a concession, the police had a concession, CIA had a concession. So for you, for you to understand where we're going to, we are leaving no stone unturned. The Zimbabwe Defense Forces must appear before us and tell us how many diamonds they mined. Uh, CIO must also tell us. Um, the how? police must also tell us. If and I can just come in there, Honorable, I want you to finish the point. But at this stage where we're looking at this retrogressively, where, where no one perhaps has even had access to any of these records to see what was produced and all that, how accurate do you think you uh, how 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 possible is it that you'll be able to get accurate information that these records you are seeing are actually there and that they are they are verifiable no there there there, there, there are people who i cannot name organizations that have information of the diamonds which went to kpc and the diamonds which did not go to kpc you've got to understand that uh, and we don't take uh, what because the the ministry will tell you that look at the figures at KPC that's what we took but is that what was mined what you took and what was mined are two different things okay so we also have got a parallel uh, uh, system that's giving us information on what was mined what saw itself at KPC what did not see itself at KPC after it was mined and so forth. So to me, it is a process that is happening, and from that we'll be able to tell that, okay, from the diamond mine, according to the figures which went to KPC, there was $2 billion, there was $3 billion and so forth. And then we now look at what was not mined, what was mined which did not get to KPC, what it is and so forth. And yes, I understand when people talk about the $15 billion figure, I think, Farai, uh, uh, credit to you, I think you have been able to justify where the $15 billion is coming from. When a head of state says $15 billion, you cannot say, no, he's too old, but on other things he's not old. <laughs> Are you with me? I mean, we've got to be very c c c consistent. You know, I mean, he's in office. I ah, know I'm Daranga Akura. Ah, you know, so we've got to be consistent. We must understand the position of the head of state. You don't take it lightly. And the figures that Farai is bringing about actually help me. And thanks for that. And that even the minister himself put it at two billion. So where did he get that from? And I think it's important for, for, for you to actually write to our committee so that you can appear before our committee with some of these figures because it helps us reach a logical conclusion at the end of the day because those were interesting figures and so forth. Because we need to really dig deep and really find out the value of our diamonds. Is it 15 billion? Was it 10 billion? Was it 5 billion and so forth? So it remains a speculative figure. That reason why it has got to be brought to closure at the end of the day by inviting all the players to account for the diamonds that they mined and so forth. The other issue that we must understand about Chinamasa, I was very disappointed even in the debate that he chose to leave out even the welfare of the war veterans. In my debate, I did mention the welfare of the war veterans, that when are we going to deal with this once and for all? But he chose to defend Obert Mpofu. After Honorable Mary Dad and myself were very clear in saying that, listen, it was wrong for the president, as far as I'm concerned, that's his prerogative, but it's not good for him because he suffers collateral damage at the end of the day by having people on board in, in cabinet who have allegations. Why don't they clear their allegations first? And I'm glad that the, the, the president has been proactive. There's, there's a memo which has come out where the chief secretary to the president and cabinet is asking all ministers and deputy ministers to account for, for their wealth. That's Parliament putting pressure. 
That is parliament, and I like that the president is being proactive. So we now need to know, since uh, uh, Honorable Chinamasa decided to be the company secretary for Obert and Pofu, I'm sure you also tell us how much tax, okay, how much tax he paid in his wealth. Because, I, I mean, it was totally out of order for him to defend, okay, Obert and Pofu without even giving the mandate. So he, I hope he's realized that he's opened a can of worms. We're going to ask him how much tax has he paid since he's so rich. Because your wealth is only seen through the tax that you pay. And I think everybody wants to know, since he's so wealthy, how much tax has he paid as a, as a businessman? And Let me so just stop you there, Honorable. We need to take a break. But I, I'm going to come back and allow you to finish the point because there are, I can see you've got more notes that you want to make there. We need to take a break. We need to cross back to our studio. But this discussion does continue. A special edition of Ask the MP coming to you live from Meikle's Hotel. Uh, if you aren't here and can't join us here then do join us on our various social media platforms facebook.com forward slash zfm stereo follow us on twitter participate in the discussion there 0731 that's the whatsapp number send your question send your comment we'll be reading many more of those when we return it is us the mp only on zfm stereo we'll be back shortly Trust promotes civic and public participation in parliament business in Zimbabwe and across the SADC region. SAP's quest is to strengthen parliaments to become truly central institutions in a democracy. The work of parliaments should promote good governance, that is, how public institutions conduct public affairs and manage resources in order to guarantee the realization of human rights. A strong parliament will promote representative democracy. For more information on the Southern African Parliament support trust visit www.sapst.org Southern African Parliamentary Support Trust promotes civic and public participation in Parliament business in Zimbabwe and across the SADC region. SAP's quest is to strengthen Parliaments to become truly central institutions in a democracy. The work of Parliaments should promote good governance, that is, how public institutions conduct public affairs and manage resources in order to guarantee the realization of human rights. A strong Parliament will promote representative democracy. For more information on the Southern African Parliamentary Support Trust, visit www.sapst.org. Music for the grown and sexy. The sweet and sassy. The fine and funky. The weird and wacky. We're the station that beats all the competition. competition. And we'll prove it as soon as we have any competition. <laughs> we, we burn down the house. Z FM Stereo. We are Z. Southern African Parliamentary Support Trust promotes civic and public participation in Parliament business in Zimbabwe and across the SADC region. SAP's quest is to strengthen Parliaments to become truly central institutions in a democracy. The work of Parliaments should promote good governance, that is, how public institutions conduct public affairs and manage resources in order to guarantee the realization of human rights. A strong Parliament will promote representative democracy. For more information on the Southern African Parliamentary Support Trust, visit www.sapst.org. Ask the MP what you want to know. It's your chance to chat to your MP and find out what goes on in Parliament. It's your show. Tweet, text and call us. The mic is yours. Welcome back to the program. It is Ask the MP, a special edition coming to you live from the Mikos Hotel in Harare Central Business District. Honorable Temba Mliskwa and Farai Magu are my guests in the studio tonight. I want to, you know, take as little time as possible uh, with these formalities and get straight into the content. Uh, Honorable Mliskwa, I know you've got some points to finish. I'll allow you to do that very shortly, but I want to read more contributions coming through because this program does belong to you as the listeners. It is driven by you and we value your contributions. Tafad Zwapa, Hanky mission in Shurugu he says how can we trust you guys that you are going to deal with this issue until you come up uh, with someone untouchable and bring the victims to justice because during the process you may be threatened or even paid so that you won't go much deeper with your investigations that's the Zimbabwe we know corruption corruption and corruption thank you so much Tafadwa for that contribution I want to take a couple of more coming through here someone says here um, 
Uh, Chiazo is a can of worms which I don't think the current establishment has the moral integrity to start asking questions, anyone questions over it. Um, someone here says, uh, uh, Good evening, uh, Honorable Mliskwa's speech sounds so good, but unfortunately these parliamentary portfolios are just toothless. I don't see the former president appearing before your committee, uh, even uh, the small guys at ZMDC or the ex-minister, or even if they appear before you, I don't see this issue going anywhere beyond your committee. Then what, Honorable? It's time the current president and government deals with untouchables, including the ones in his cabinet. That is Baame Lucy getting in touch. Thank you so much. Keep those contributions coming through. A listener asked earlier, and perhaps uh, you know we can get confirmation here, suggesting that there was a, an audit, a team of auditors that was appointed by the Ministry uh, of uh, of uh, Mines to look into this matter. He says, please, can you find out whatever happened to the auditors who were appointed? Where is their report? Who are they? Where is that? Uh, perhaps you can also respond to some of those issues. I think I want to read a couple of more coming through, uh, and do keep these contributions coming through. Thank you so much. Um, uh, those involved must be arrested. We are suffering. Uh, thank you so much. There are a lot more, and we'll, we'll get to those. Honorable Meliswa, uh, issues of, uh, you know, you might be intimidated, you might be influenced. Uh, what's your take on that? I, I don't understand. I think uh, uh, one is entitled to their own opinion. I never argue or fight with anyone's opinion in life. That that's your opinion. But I think what is in, important is to appreciate that there's, there, there is work being done. And I think we have a very vibrant committee. And uh, people are invited to even come and sit in the gallery and follow the proceedings. The problem with our people too, they also don't realize that they can come. And uh, I invite him to come and sit in the, in the gallery. He will be my guest, follow the processions and see who, at what point did we miss anything and so forth. People, Zimbabweans, must understand that Parliament is open to you all. And you can come and follow those proceedings, committees, and hear what's going on and so forth. And I think what is important is that read all the recommendations from our portfolio committee in terms of the former Minister Chidakwa, what we said in terms of the former permanent secretary, Kujianga, what we said and so forth, we unearth a lot. And in unearthing a lot, it required the political will of the then president, uh, Mugabe, to do something about it. He did not. As parliament, we can only go so far, but it's up to the president as well to exercise his powers through showing that political will to see to show that he wants to deal with corruption. I mean, look at, uh, we also expose the aspect of, look at the way Marange and all these diamond mines were taken over. I mean, Chombo was Minister of Finance, Minister of Home Affairs. I always say this, and I've always said this before. How can you put him as Minister of uh, Home Affairs when he's actually not supposed to? And true to effect, he ended up being arrested as soon as he was moved from Minister of Home Affairs. So this was some of the... But he ordered 300, 300 police officers with AK rifles to go and take over these mines. He's coming before us. Because when they went there, they also took over the area. There was no handover takeover. They also took over the area where the diamonds were. So 300 policemen went there to take over Mbada and so forth. When Mbada and them were mining, there was some money going into the fiscus. After that, there was no money. Chihuri was the commissioner general and so forth. They've got to be asked when they went to do that, who gave them the order and the diamonds which were there, where did they go? We cannot have an aspect of not having rule or flow in a country where investors put in money and one moment you just wake up and say, we're going to send 500 police officers to go and take over. Not, not in this new dispensation. And any leader who wants to support that in this new dispensation will certainly not be ruling this country for so long. People are now away Zimbabweans are brave. They know who the leader that they want. We are now sharpened more than any other time and so forth. And I'm glad that the, 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 the president that we have, being a lawyer, has got to ensure that the rule of law goes back. You need to have people like Farai who also went through a tough time being able to be free to express themselves, give the information, investigations are done, and so forth. Failure for that, it would be very difficult for you to actually lead this country. So we need to really have rule of law going back, and I think that's pretty critical. The other issue which I needed 
they also bring to attention was the aspect of um, three inconsistent. I, I think uh, there's, there's, there's been all, so much policy inconsistency in the past, and I'm saying to the people, let's be patient. If we talk about a new dispensation, why don't we give each other a chance to? and see how we perform. Because I know people are impatient, they want results tomorrow and so forth. But equally, it's also for you to also take part as well. So the inconsistency which was there, we've got to ensure that that falls away and we deal with facts at the end of the day, which will really benefit all of us at the end of the day. Honorable Melisco, thank you so much. Uh, you made mention to uh, you know, uh, this directive we've seen for declaration of assets, which I think are all the right steps that are being taken by this administration. We look forward to those declarations of assets so that they are made public. I'm just reminded before I come to you, Farai, about, you know, I attended a, a meeting once at the FDB where they were talking about illicit financial flows and declaration of assets. And I'll never forget this minister from Sierra Leone who said that, uh, you know, officials were asked to declare their assets. And one guy said, you know what, I've got five houses, I've got two sports cars, I've got four land crews, all these things. And when they investigated and followed through, they discovered that he actually didn't have those things. But... He was declaring what he expected to have at the end of his term. So, <laughs> that was quite interesting in terms of what happened in Sierra Leone. Uh, Farah, I, I just want to ask you something here. Um, mm -hmm. I know there were some points you were raising to me during the break. I'll, I'll allow you to come through there as well. But mm -hmm. in all this, I think we need to spare thought. We're talking about uh, people who obviously have, uh, you know, are in influential posts, high-ranking officials, uh, some of them. But... We also need to spare thought for the villagers of Chiazwa who were moved out. Who, where are they now? What, what, what is, I mean, and they will also ask Romulisco if they are looking into that, you know, what happened to these people who were relocated? We heard about relocations. What's the status of the ordinary folk in, in, in Chiazwa? Okay, thank you, Ferrari. Um, we work with people in Ade Transau. Uh, Ada Transau is located about 30 kilometers out of Mutare. This is where these people are located. There are over 1,300 families comprising of over 30,000 persons. Now, 99% of the promises which were made by the government were never followed through. So these people have got a plethora of crises. They have a crisis of water. They were promised the water. There's no water for them. I think we've counted about five children who have drowned in Oz River as they try to fetch water for domestic cause. They are surviving through selling grass, firewood, and anything. And when they are caught cutting the grass and the firewood, they are punished by the chief who is in the neighboring uh, area who's saying you are cutting, you are, you are destroying the environment. There's a problem of education. The schools that were promised were never built. If I show you a picture of one of the schools at Ada Transau, it is like a, a pig stay. You don't believe that children are, stay, uh, are studying there. Um, there is a problem of hunger. They were never given adequate land for cultivation. The plots they were given is the size of a football pitch. And we go all over the world beating our chest about the successful land reform program. We have got ministers, we have got over 15 farms, including the former president. But we have got Zimbabwean citizens who were dispossessed of their land and they are living in a football pitch. And when Donald Trump talk about the asshole countries, African leaders get mad at him. So the situation at Ada Transau it's a humanitarian crisis. It's a disaster that is unfolding. And you need to be, have a very strong heart to talk to the people at Ada Transau. And they've put a war veteran there who manages information. If you go in at Ada Transau, it's like a prison. You, you have to seek permission to talk to the people at Ada Transau. So those are some of the, of the problems there. There is no source of employment, no industry. So it's like a community that was uprooted and dumped in the middle of Norway. And you can imagine what will happen to the children who are growing up there. We've got families who were relocated, a father and his wife and teenage sons. When the sons get married, 
They are still sharing the same three-bedroomed house with their parents. There's no room for expansion of the settlement. So those are some of the crises that are the transfer. We're going to take a few more questions from our audience here. I know that there was a lady there. I had promised I would come back to her. We've got a gentleman there and the young man over there. So if we can take those three, we'll start with the lady, the gentleman at the corner there with his hand up, and then the young man in the middle row here. Those three, then I'll come to you in, 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 in that corner. All right. Thank you very much. My first question goes to Temba Muliswa. Um, thank you very much for finally being the voice of reason in the National Assembly for bringing up the issue of the missing $15 billion. Though I still feel that we kind of like window dressing here. Why? Because there are still a lot of people within the ministry, within the parliament, who are beneficiaries of the missing $15 billion. And I am of um, the idea that Section 98 of the Constitution of Zimbabwe should actually be revoked because it encourages the president to be engaged in illegal activities, in corrupt activities, and you can never bring him to account. And my question to you is, after you're done with your investigations and you realize that the current president is a beneficiary of the missing $15 billion, how are you going to deal with it since Section 98 says it cannot be taken to a court of law, to a criminal court of law to be precise? And my second um, contribution is on Obert Mpofu. Thank you very much for raising that. Because when I was still an NRZ employee in 2011, Obert Mpofu apparently and allegedly bought 23 locomotives. Yet the National Railways of Zimbabwe, 37 years after independence, has failed to buy a single locomotive. Please can you also investigate this matter? Because the very same locomotives were said to be uh, bought by Makomo when the investigation started. And they have since been stopped from operating. And lastly, to Farai Magu, thank you for raising the albatross issue. And I also wanted to ask if the former workers from Bada Diamonds have been paid off um, their terminal benefits and their retrenchment packages after the closure of the companies. Thank you. Thank you so much. I just want to tell our listeners who've been there, well, viewers who've been following us on Facebook Live, we're having a slight challenge with that uh, link, so uh, we apologize for that and we're trying to rectify it as quickly as possible, but uh, we hope to be back online very, very shortly, but do feel free to listen to us live as well as follow the discussion on Twitter. Uh, please go ahead, sir. If I could just ask those who are contributing here, as I do ask all our other participants via the various platforms to just identify themselves, say who they are, and go ahead with their contributions. Thanks, Farai. My name is Alex Rosero. Um, I have some comments or questions uh, for my friend, Honorable MP, Honorable Mliswa. Uh, you have raised important issues pertaining rule by law that was taking place where a minister would simply order the closure of mines, the taking over of mines without proper ending over, end over takeover procedures. But where was the oversight role in all that? Uh, as Zimbabwe, do we need the military to step in first to restore confidence of parliament in as much as some of the duties that the parliament has to take, have to take our consent? Do we have oversight role before or after certain aspects, especially pertaining to justice, uh, would have taken place? Then to Brother Magu, I also happen to come from Manikaland. Yes, in as much as you have painted a gloomy picture of other Transau, I think let's also be fair and honest uh, in terms of the livelihoods of people in other vis-a-vis -vis how they were living in Marange. I think they are better off in terms of infrastructure, in terms of even um, their houses, in terms of schools. But I don't think, I don't subscribe to the aspect where villagers ought to live on government and out through and through. Because if you look at their lifestyles uh, in Marange as compared to other trans, I think they are somewhere better as compared to Tokwem Kosi victims, uh, for example. So I think we also have to be honest uh, in that regard. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, and I, lastly, there's a young man. Yeah, please go ahead, sir, and then we'll... Yes, uh, thank you, thank you. I just want to ask, Kuti, is there a chance of recovering this uh, 15 billion which was stolen, considering, Kuti, we, in our government, there are so many corrupt people? And if there's a chance, could you please like, uh, explain if you have like, a plan that you have uh, put in place or that you want to implement in the future. 
Thank you so much for that contribution. A couple of more coming through here via uh, WhatsApp. We have um, uh, someone here saying, was it normal for the army, CIO, and police to be given concessions to mine? This appears to be outside their mandate. Uh, another listener here asking, um, uh, it is good to have Comrade Mliso as chairman of the uh, mines committee. My question is, what should we do on the mines that are closed in the mines uh, that are, have people squabbling over their ownership, people taking each other to court while there's no production for the growth of our economy? I suppose that speaks to what is the status now of, uh, you know, the diamonds we keep being told. Perhaps you can uh, give us a bit more uh, clarity on that. Let me begin with you, Farai, to respond to some of the issues that were raised. Okay. Uh, start with the last one uh, which uh, my brother said um, the, the, the relocated people are better off now than they were in Marange I'm glad you, you say this uh, in the comfort of Migros Hotel and uh, not at other Transau otherwise we would struggle to protect you from the villagers <laughs> um, the situation in other Transau like I said before it's like a prison. There is no source of livelihood. Uh, if you know one source of livelihood at Ada Transau, please tell this audience. But what I know is that these people were filled China Kwamarangi as far as the mining companies were concerned. They were displaced in the Muramba China style get out of here at gunpoint. They were never given time even to harvest their crops. And uh, one thing I want you to know, when the displacement was taking place, the bulldozers were pulling down people's homes in their prisons when they were seeing what you own. The purpose of destroying the homes was to ensure that these people are really informed in no uncertain terms that Marange is no longer their home. You need to go and talk to a guy called Kambeni at Ada Transau. When I spoke with Kambeni in 2012, he was crying. He was literally, he was crying, he was shedding tears. He's a man in his 70s. There is no land. This way, people were surviving in Kurima. Pa other trans south, Chawaka go pi wat Zimba. Zimba zacho zaka wakwa ni machaina. Ndi muno jizwa kujizwa kujizwa machaina ajigari. Ziriku, ziriku tse muka Zimba zacho. Saka, they were not looking for homes, these people. A person is happy mo hati yake iyo yo. Aka kumberez gwa ni michero yake. Aka kumberez gwa ni amazake. Than being uprooted and given a place to live in the middle of nowhere. So there are many things to talk about which this people no longer have access to at the other trans south. So I disagree with you, but there could be some people who are happy. I wouldn't want to, to dismiss that argument. But I would say if there are people who are happy, they are actually in the minority. Only last year, a group of relocated people went back to Marange by force. So, a clan kind of, and they went back to, to Chiazwa. That's how desperate they are for their homeland. And finally, on the issue of workers, uh, which Linda asked, the last time I checked, the workers were not paid. Uh, and the government, despite having dismissed the Mbada Diamonds, it never took any remedial action to protect its own citizens from unfair labor practices. Yet there are many things which government could have done. Mbada diamonds, yaka see a stockpile of diamonds. Because waka zingir were at gunpoint. Those kwa marangi. Even waripo right now wacha zingir were at gunpoint. Saka when they were chased out of marangi, they left diamonds. Waka a mound. Ye oh, diamond oh. They could have processed that all and gave my workers their juice. They didn't do it. Number two, government seized equipment in Mbada. They could have sold that equipment and settled my Jews. 
But being an asshole nation that we are, <laughs> they only thought about themselves and they never concerned themselves about the, the, the welfare of the workers. Thank you. Uh, let me uh, stop you again there. We need to take a break. Another break. We'll be back very shortly. Honorable Mlisko, I know there are quite a number of questions that are uh, directed at you. Uh, clearly, Farai Magu is... Um, uh, you know, uh, pre really consumed by these statements by American President Donald Trump. Thank you so much. ZFM Stereo, my station, your station, Ask the MP, only on this station, a special edition coming to you live from Meikle's Hotel. We're focusing on the diamond sector, the missing 15 billion. Is it 15 billion or not? We don't know, but there is a committee that is trying to get to the bottom of matters, and that's what we're unpacking today. Stay tuned. We'll be back shortly. Support Trust promotes civic and public participation in Parliament business in Zimbabwe and across the SADC region. SAF's quest is to strengthen parliaments to become truly central institutions in a democracy. The work of parliaments should promote good governance, that is, how public institutions conduct public affairs and manage resources in order to guarantee the realization of human rights. A strong parliament will promote representative democracy. For more information on the Southern African Parliamentary Support Trust, visit www.sapst.org. Music for the grown and sexy. 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 Sexy